Perfect. So if you don't know me already, my name is Richard Moglin. Um, I post YouTube videos and I'm a part of Trailline, a stock education uh, mentorship program. And today I'll be sharing kind of 10 key lessons I've learned from a bunch of interviews I've done with uh, money managers, portfolio managers, US investing champions, and veteran traders. So here's a little bit about me as well. Um, I am the host of the Market Chat podcast and the Trailline podcast. Uh, there's a list of a few notable interviews I've done. Uh, I also interviewed Brian Feraldi, who just went. Um, and I try to get a good mix of both kind of fundamental side of things as well as top traders. Um, and what's cool is I'm, I'm closing in on a million listens on my podcast, which is awesome, mind-blowing number. Thank you. And here's a cool graphic I, I, I thought I'd make uh, yesterday about kind of the time frame of different, um, basically, guests I've interviewed. Um, going over to the left is longer time frame, more investor side of things. And to the right, all the way to the right, is Tomas Claro, who was second last year in the US Investing Championship, who does a ton of intraday trading. And if you're curious about finding somebody who kind of matches your own personal style and time frame, uh, this is a good way to find somebody who basically uh, trades your own style. Um, any baseball fans out there? Any Nats fans out there? There you go, over there. All right, only going to talk to you from now on, OK? All right. This is Juan Soto. One more Nats fan over there? No? OK. Uh, so this is Juan Soto, the greatest hitter that has ever lived. Um, and I see a ton of parallel between becoming a great baseball player, becoming a great soccer player, and trading. Um, and in, er, in order to basically become great at baseball, trading, whatever, um, you want to study the greats. You want to kind of break down what makes them successful. If you're trying to learn how to hit, how to pitch, it makes sense to study people who are already incredibly uh, good at it. And um, what you kind of want to distill is the routines, habits, techniques that make them successful. And obviously, there's a bunch of hard work to put in. You have to put in the mental and physical reps to get better and it's all about preparation, preparation and mindset. And the way I see it, trading is essentially the same. It's, it's all mental, um, but you have to do your own due diligence and put in the work before you can really excel. And uh, in my view, you have to train like a champion to trade like a champion. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about key kind of lessons I've learned from uh, traders who have been doing this for decades. Uh, Mark Minervini, author of some great trading books, Stan Weinstein as well, Secrets, Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets. Um, and once again, you have to study the best of the best. And what's great is um, the pieces are out there often for free on the internet. There's so many interviews. Um, I'll humbly mention my YouTube channel. I think it's a great resource. Um, but th there's so many great resources out there that's so easy to really shorten your learning curve nowadays. And what's really important is you want to focus inward. Um, you're not in really in competition with anybody else in this room. You're competing with yourself. Um, and you're competing with yourself um, from one day ago, one month ago, one year ago. And your only goal should be a little bit better than you were yesterday. Just be 1% better. Uh, try to find those elements, your weaknesses, and just slowly improve those. And to do that, what you really need to do is look back on your trades and conduct post-analysis. Uh, and I see some people taking pictures of the slides. Um, I'll have uh, my email up there. And if you just send me an email, I can share it, no problem. Uh, but the most important thing, the one thing you have to remember is nothing matters unless you commit to learning. Uh, regardless of your strategy, whether you're trying to find multi-baggers and hold them for years like Brian, um, or if you're trying to become a great swing trader like Brian Shannon, um, you have to commit and focus only on that particular style. And just curious, how many people in this room would describe themselves as traders? Raise, raise your hand. All right, investors. Oh, wow basically a 50-50 split. So a lot of the elements I'll be talking about are mostly focused on trading, but there's a lot of parallels um, that you can take away as well. So lesson one, trading takes patience and hard work. Um, every single one of the hedge fund managers, uh, Mark Minervini, all of them struggled for years to find their style and uh, basically put in the work to excel. And um, to achieve results, they basically studied what worked in the past and also studied the highest performing stocks as well, trying to find those common characteristics that they all shared so they can apply that to the future. And what's really important is they focused, as I said, on one particular style and time frame. You're not gonna be the best long-term investor and day trader, it's just not gonna happen. Focus on one style, focus on being 
basically extremely profitable at that one style, and then maybe you can branch out a little bit. And uh, many of the top traders I've interviewed read similar books, uh, Nicholas Starvis, O'Neill, Livermore Douglas. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. The information is already out there. A lot of price action based trading has not changed one bit over the past 100 years. And that's because it's all market psychology and that doesn't change. Lesson two, stay positive, stay focused, stay disciplined. Uh, who, he, who in this room knows Jim Ropel? All right, if, if you know him, you know he's the most positive guy. You cannot watch an interview without becoming incredibly inspired. Um, so definitely check out his interviews. Um, and it pays to be a bull over the long term. We all know the trend of the stock market is up. Um, and you want to treat setbacks as learning moments. Um, as I said, it's all about incremental impro improvement over time. Um, as I mentioned, you want to stick to one strategy and become a master of that before moving on to other setups and methods. And you want to commit to your learning. And I think this is a really important point. You want to judge your trading based on whether you executed your plan going into it, not whether you made money or lost money. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but this is the only way to become consistently profitable because otherwise you can't tweak your style and you have to judge your trading based on the execution of your plan. And ideally, you, you, guys, you basically plan out your trades going into the trading day. Lesson three, stay in tune with your own trading. Uh, you want to keep a, a journal, a mental picture of how recent trades have performed. Um, and I'm an engineer by trade. Um, I, I think of kind of in these feedback loops. So here I've got a graphic of the action and the effect. And then of course you've got the feedback. Now you want to, based on your trading results, take that market feedback into account and practice progressive exposure. And progressive exposure is basically when you're trading well and trading at your best, you want to increase exposure, try new trades, increase position size. But if you've got multiple failed breakouts, you're not trading well, uh, the market and the environment is just not right for your style at that moment, and you want to scale back. And this way, to kind of paraphrase Mark Minervini, you'll be trading your largest when you're trading your best and your smallest when you're trading your worst. And this will automatically get you out of bad markets and get you very exposed when things turn around. Um, so I've got some examples here. If pilot trades are working after a correction, increase exposure, do it slowly and finance that risk. And a big, big thing here is you are never forced to trade. A lot of people over trade by thinking they need to uh, trade every day or, or force things. But if things are not working, often the market and yourself are not right and you want to wait for that to change. Lesson number four, focus only on high potential stocks. Uh, so this is actually very similar to what Brian was talking about when I, when I talk about true market leaders. It's those incredibly fast growing companies that have the best margins, sales growth, earnings growth. But I also like to focus on stocks showing superior uh, price action and relative strength. And relative strength basically means over a certain period, they're outperforming the market. And ideally, you have a combination of both. And that's kind of what happened with Tesla last year where uh, we saw superior price action and then a beautiful setup and also the fundamentals were aligning right at that same time. Before I buy it, I always like to see significant um, accumulation, signs of accumulation, huge gaps up, gap ups on volume and other signs like pocket pivots. And I also prefer an early stage base, meaning a stock that is just starting a move and formed a nice consolidation. I also want to find leading stocks and leading groups that are outperforming the market together. That just kind of boosts the probabilities of a trade working. And as I said, breakout sales growth, earnings growth, those are always bonuses. Finally, I will not trade a stock if the long-term trend is down. I always want to have the window and back and basically the market agreeing with me even before I take a trade. Lesson number, four, le lesson number five, use charts to identify setups and time trades. Just curious here, who thinks timing the market is impossible? Okay. Uh, well, I think timing the market is difficult, but you can definitely time individual trades by buying at very tight volatility contraction patterns and using that and buying the breakouts. Uh, so as I said, you always want to look out for standout relative strength and institutional footprints before you buy anything. And as traders, I'm not looking to basically sit through a base. That's what investors do. I'm trying to leverage both time and money. So I want to buy right at that breakout point, right as it's, as it's moving through resistance. And I want to enter at a point basically where there's a large directional move expected and either I'm at a profit right away or I can exit with a small loss knowing that the setup has failed. 
And uh, chart reading, I think, can benefit even long-term investors. All you have to do is expand your time frame, use weekly charts, use weekly moving averages instead of focusing on daily patterns and intraday. And uh, I don't know how I knew this, but I knew Brian, would, Brian Shannon would say only price pays at least once during his presentation. So uh, that's always something uh, important to remember. So here's a little bit more on why to use charts. You can analyze supply and demand. You can clearly define stop loss and profit taking area and define your risk reward. And as Tom Basso said, the closer you can get your indicators to that which is creating your profits and creating the risk, the more you can control things and run a tighter ship. So lesson number six, I think this is one of the most important thing if you are trading, you have to manage risk tightly and use stop losses. And even before I take a trade, I automatically know, I already know basically where I'm gonna exit the trade. Uh, your stop loss should be placed right where the setup fails. Um, if you're buying a breakout, if that breakout doesn't hold, uh, you most likely should sell that stock because something isn't acting right. And once you've defined your stop loss, that percentage loss, you can use position sizing to limit equity losses to small fractions of your account. 0.5% to 1% is great for beginners. If you're more experienced, you can go a little bit higher, maybe even 2%, but this is a great kind of per uh, position amount to start with. And this is one of the most important things of this presentation. If you cannot manage risk, don't take the trade. If you cannot manage risk, do not take the trade. Uh, you're pushing yourself, you're trying to force something that isn't happening, and either you missed it, it's extended, um, or it's just not properly set up. And either way, you should wait for your pitch. Uh, going back to baseball, wait for your pitch and wait for a better opportunity. Once again, you never have to take, take a trade if you do not want to. Uh, per position, the best traders I've interviewed like to keep their stop losses on their positions under 5%. Uh, so that's pretty tight. I know the classic O'Neill says um, 8%, but um, basically everybody who, who uses CanSlim, who I've talked to, uh, they like to keep it much, much tighter than that, 5%, even 3%. Uh, so I definitely recommend under 5%. And what you also want to do is cut losses a fraction of your average gain. So what you want to do is create a, an Excel document, upload all your trades and calculate your average gain on winning positions and your average loss on losing positions, as well as the percentage of trades that are profitable, and that's your batting average. And based on those three statistics, you can basically determine what your trading statistics are. And if your average gain is a three to one multiple of your average loss, you're in pretty good shape. You've built in a lot of failure. But if it's one to one, you really have to be right more than 50% of the time to even be profitable, and that's not a situation that you want to be in. And just to reemphasize the point that cutting losses is the most important thing when it comes to trading, um, I've got a table over here, and you can see how once you let a loss really trickle down here to 20, 25%, you need significant, uh, a significant price increase just to get back to break even. This moves geometrically against you. And as a trader, as I mentioned, we're leveraging time and money. We're not putting 2% uh, of our entire portfolio in one single stock like investors do slowly over time. Instead, we're trying to enter at very specific points where either the trade works or we're stopped out. So if you're taking a loss on a 15%, 10%, 20% position, uh, you cannot let that fall more than 8%, more than 10%. Otherwise, it's just too difficult to get back to break even. Lesson number seven, establish routines and practice discipline. Um, all of the top traders, hedge fund managers, position traders that I've interviewed have some type of weekly routine as well as a daily routine. And in their weekly routine, this is very important. They keep track of the market. They also keep track of how their recent performance has been. And this way they can basically use that progressive exposure to decide how aggressive or defensive they wanna be in the market next week. Also during this weekly routine, a common element I see is they build a focus list. And this is the best of the best setups going into next week. And this doesn't mean that everybody who trades, um, trades in the market should have the same focus list. Dependent on your style, whether you're a pullback buyer, a breakout buyer, this list could be very different. But the most important thing is that you focus on the top 0.01% of stocks within your system. Um, as I mentioned, you want all the probabilities with you, and those top setups are gonna basically increase your batting average. 
And another important thing is on the weekends, what I like to do is outline entries, outline the risk I'm gonna take, outline position sizing, so when the market bell rings on Monday or Tuesday, um, basically, you're already ready to go if that stock moves to the pivot. Um, as many decisions as you can make outside of market hours, the more objective you're gonna be and the better you can manage your risk and execute. Now moving on to the daily routine, all of the traders, the top traders who, I, who I've interviewed also have some sort of daily routine. And this starts with situational awareness. Now situational awareness is going back to understanding whether you're trading well, whether the market is right for your style, and then basically determining how aggressive you wanna be in the market. Another thing that a lot of the top traders do who I've interviewed is they visualize every particular scenario that can happen with any stock that they own, as well as any stocks they would like to buy. So uh, once the stock actually does one of those options, they're ready to go, they've already thought about what, what can happen, they've already thought about what they're gonna do in response to that, and then they just have to execute the trade. Now, one thing I've started af after interviewing um, all these traders is focusing on a lot less names per day. And I think less than five names is a good balance here Everything else you should just ignore. Um, Twitter, you should try to avoid actually during the trading day. Um, how many people here have taken a trade after seeing another trader do it on Twitter? How'd that work out for you? Yeah. Don't, don't succumb to FOMO. Plan out every single trade beforehand. Um, it, will, it will work out for you better in the long haul for sure. Um, so once you've got those five names, those under five names ideally, what you wanna do is set alerts right below the point that you wanna buy, that pivot. Um, I use a lot of strat techniques. I know there's not too many in the audience, but if you're looking for a 2-2 reversal, put it right below the prior day's high. That way you can be watching the chart as it tries to push up through that pivot. And the more you focus on just a few select names, uh, the better you're gonna trade those names. You're gonna manage risk better. You're gonna be able to get a tighter, uh, tighter basically buy, get a better cost, and just execute better in general. And as I said, once you've decided things, everything in advance, once the market bell rings and a stock moves to that pivot, all you have to do, that's left to do, is execute. And then another key component of a daily plan is once the market closes, you basically prep for the next day. Um, how many people here have an end of day routine for the stock market? Oh, that's, that's actually more than I thought. If you do not, set yourself up for success the next day. Put in the work, put in 30 minutes, find the best ideas for the next, for the next trading day, and basically be ready so during pre-market you don't have to rush, and when the basically market bell rings, you're not trying to find the next top moving stock. You're already ready and good to go and have a plan going in. Uh, you also want to re review your trades, think about how well you executed, you executed your plan. Moving on to lesson eight. Uh, you wanna sell systematically and objectively. Um, who here agrees that selling is the toughest part of trading? Yeah, the majority, for sure. Uh, I definitely agree. Now, selling, there's kind of two main ways to sell, right? There's selling into strength as the stock is continuous, continuously moving up, and there's selling into weakness, for instance, as it's breaking the 50-day moving average, um, and the trend is kind of ending. Uh, now, depending on your style, whether you're a swing trader or position trader, you're gonna kind of gravitate to one selling method that works best. Uh, swing traders like to sell on the way up, so their equity curve uh, stays right near highs, but if you're trying to hold a stock for the long term and hold a true market leader for the full 18 months during its run, you're most likely going to want to sell at least the majority of your position on weakness, just so you stay with that trend until it bends. Now going back to um, your statistics, your batting average, your average gain, average loss, this can help you decide when to sell. And that's why I think it's so important to calculate those statistics. And um, curious here, how many people know their average gain, average loss, and batting average over the past 100 trades? Look around the room, about five of you. Do you think knowing those statistics would help you, help your performance overall? Raise your hand. All right, you guys got a lot, to, a lot of work to do, huh? A lot of homework this weekend. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. You can set up an Excel sheet. Um, it does take time, but it will help you know the truth about your trading and identify your weakness, weaknesses. If your batting average is low, you know you gotta kind of focus on higher probability setups. If your average loss and average gain are pretty close to each other, you really have to work on only identifying stocks that have really good uh, risk to reward ratio setups. 
I want to be tagged on Twitter later with a bunch of people statistics, by the way. <laughs> All right, so going back to selling on weakness, you want to ride the trend until it breaks expectations. And a really easy way to do this is using moving averages. Um, I personally like the 21 EMA and 50 SMA. I'm, my, my personal style, if you're curious, is more a hybrid swing position trader. I like to hold a stock as it's trending above the 21 EMA, and that likes to, basically I've noticed that in a lot of leading names after a strong breakout, it will hold that for an extended period. Uh, but when you have a significant gain, you can also switch over to the 50-day simple as well as the 65 EMA. Uh, my personal style, I don't feel comfortable sitting through bases. Um, I don't know how long they're going to last or how deep a correction they're going to be. Uh, so I might sell a stock too early, but if I'm watching it and it sets up again, I can always re-enter at another low risk buy point. So depending on your style, you're going to want to sell into strength or weakness. It's just a choice that you have to make. And uh, it really depends on your market style. And I think the shorter your time frame, whether you're a swing trader, the more likely you're going to gravitate towards selling into strength. Lesson number nine, concentrate into positions. Uh, you basically want to size positions size position so that they will move the needle if you make a good trade. Um, but you also want to be very careful to avoid the risk of ruin. Uh, so I'm curious here, raise your hand if your max position size is greater than 5%. 10 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%. 50%? All right, majority of you guys. Okay. Um, so a lot of the top traders who I've interviewed, uh, their kind of sweet spot is between four and 10 positions. Uh, this might seem extremely concentrated to a bunch of you investors, but as a trader, that's a pretty good about 15% um, max position size. And that really allows you to focus on only the best names that are trending and breaking out of strong bases. I think one of the best benefits of this that I think is very underrated is that having a low number of positions allows you to, to basically pay special attention to them and be very um, up to date on how they're acting and you can actually learn the behavior of the stock and know when something has changed. Uh, for instance, UPST recently, it was trending above the 10 day simple, but recently it had a little bit of a character change and broke under that key moving average, suggesting that a little bit more consolidation was needed. It's currently holding the 21 EMA, but that significant character change of breaking that key moving average that it had been holding uh, could indicate it needs a little bit more time. Uh, so in short, holding less positions, I think, allows you to execute better on those positions, manage risk better, and also know when to sell. As I mentioned, you want to learn how each stock trades. You can learn the character of a stock, and that way you know when it's behaving correctly and when it changes. And Another thing that this concentration allows you to do is just a few strong trades can make your year, but on the flip side, to make sure you avoid that risk of ruin, you have to manage risk very tightly. And going back to the risk management, um, I think holding your stop loss per position under 5% is a great way to manage things. And I definitely personally don't let anything go further than 7, 8%. Finally, going back to baseball here, lesson 10, uh, you want to watch your game film, you want to conduct post analysis and identify your weaknesses. And this is also going back to calculating your summary statistics, which all of you guys, that's your homework. Um, and this is as true for investing as trading. Uh, you want to identify what went right, what went right in your process that resulted in that great trade. Um, also on your losers, on your five worst losers, um, analyze those the most carefully and analyze those common characteristics that went wrong. Uh, did you enter at a bad position? Did you enter when it was extended? Did you enter when it was just pulling back in a downtrend? Um, know the truth about your training. I know it hurts to analyze losers, but you have to do it. That's really what's going to improve your training the most. Another big thing is you want to ask yourself, did you follow and execute your plan? Uh, did you enter off a tip from your friend or off Twitter? Or did you have a plan going into the training day that you executed from your weekend routine? As I said, look at the common aspects of your best trades, your worst trades. What are your statistics? Are you cutting losses properly? That's probably the single biggest um, issue that a lot of new traders have is cutting those losses, cutting those losses, cutting those losses. Think about what you can improve on. What rules and routines can you create to do so? Um, I personally have decided to basically journal everything after the market closed. That helps me basically stay in touch with my emotions, how I'm trading, and basically that goes back into the feedback, feedback loop. And I know how much exposure in the market I should have. And finally, doing these 
uh, post analysis, maybe monthly, even every quarter or half a year, it results in that incremental improvement and identifying those weaknesses so you can then apply that to future trades. So that's pretty much it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you haven't already. Uh, this is my name for, for YouTube. And if you would like a copy of the slides, uh, just shoot me an email over at richard at And um, I'd be happy to take any questions you guys have.